Okay, so now I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speaker, whose name is Lizzie Crotty. She works for Friends of Australian Wildlife Conservancy as the Philanthropic Relationships Lead for the UK. Originally from Tasmania, Lizzie started a research career focusing on seabirds in the Southern Ocean and now lives in London permanently. Lizzie holds a Bachelor of Environmental Science honours from the University of Queensland. She's currently studying an MBA part-time through Imperial College Business School, and she's got a wealth of information and some beautiful photographs to share with us. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to hand you over to Lizzie. Lizzie, you should be able to do your screen share now, I think. Okay, how's that, Maria? Yep, that looks great. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Uh, sorry, I'm just, um, oops, starting too soon. Just trying to go into presenter mode over here. Yep, just takes time. Ooh. Yeah, it's probably just a toggle, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Radio. Okay. okay. All right. Back. That's great. <laughs> Got there in the end. Great. Thank you so much, um, Maria. And yeah, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here speaking virtually to you all tonight. Um, it really looks like the London Natural History Society covers a fascinating array of topics. Um, I heard it was earthworms last week. So this is going to be a little bit different to that. And I'm really pleased to be here to join your list of speakers. So as Maria mentioned, I, uh, my name is Lizzie Crotty and I'm the philanthropy lead for the UK, one of the world's largest owners or managers of land for conservation in Australia. Uh, and that is the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. So that was interesting to see that we have a few people in the crowd who have been to Australia and even two who live there. So great to uh, connect with the fellow Aussies here. So who, those of you who clicked yes in that poll might be at a slight advantage here, but I am going to ask everyone a question to start with, and you can just put the answer in the chat. Can anyone guess what this bird is? So I'll give you a few seconds, and I need to also find the chat here. Here we go. Not a Rosella. Oh, okay, yep, yep. Yep, very well done. Okay, the Gouldian Finch. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> now that it fell in a hoover bag, I love that. So, yes, we have a Gouldian Finch on the screen and we have um, a little guy behind me called an Owlet Nightjar. So that was a bit of a tricky one that I, uh, I threw at you, but very well, well done for guessing. So... Um, I'm just going to begin this evening by, you know, I'm aware that you've had a lot of talks like this and probably a very environmentally conscious group. So um, just by echoing what a lot of us in this, in this talk probably already know, it's that we really are at a critical point for conservation and the environment. And overall, the, the indicators of environmental health really aren't looking good. We're getting a lot of bad news in the press um, and, you know, it just seems like there's a lot of doom and gloom. So we're really feeling this in particular in Australia. But in saying that and acknowledging all of that, for the first time, we really do have all of the tools we need to actually turn this completely around. So tonight I'm going to share with you an inspiring story about how effective science-based land management is providing hope for Australia's threatened wildlife. So Australia is one of the most biologically diverse countries on the planet. We're home to between seven to 10% of all species on earth. And our wildlife is unique. Many of these species are found nowhere else in the world. You won't stumble across echidna and echidna anywhere else. Uh, the Australian wildlife and ecosystems represent a precious natural asset, something that we should nurture and celebrate. And yet as a country, we have a very poor record of looking after our wildlife and ecosystems. 34 mammal, uh, mammal species have gone extinct since European colonization. And that represents about a third of the world's mammal extinctions over that period. 
It gives Australia the incredibly morbid title of having the worst rate of mammal extinction in the world. So these extinctions are continuing to the present day. It's not just historical. So this figure on the screen just shows the number of threatened species listed in our national legislation over time. And the trajectory here suggests that more extinctions are inevitable. So this pattern is pretty sobering, but it's not unique. Australia is part of a global extinction crisis. A recent UN Global Assessment report found that around 1 million species already face extinction and many more within decades, unless urgent action is taken to reduce the intensity of drivers of biodiversity lost. So what happens if we don't intervene? Well, I'm sure a lot of you have either heard of or maybe even visited Kakadu. It's Australia's most iconic and heavily protected national park. But I'm going to be using it as an example of what's going wrong in Australia's protected areas. So in just over a decade, with an annual budget of nearly 15 million pounds, Kakadu has seen a 90% decline of its small mammal abundance. So this is an incredibly poor return on ecological investment. So what is, what's actually going wrong here? Well, there are two things. One is the direct cause of this decline, which is poor fire management, feral herbivores and feral cats, which I'm going to go into in a bit more detail. But the real underlying cause of this is the lack of accountability of public investment spending in national parks. And this isn't just at Kakadu, it's right around Australia. So we no longer have ignorance as an excuse. Over the last couple of decades, ecologists have built up a really good understanding of the processes driving extinction in Australia. So we've got grazing by feral cattle and herbivores. We've got the impacts of feral predators, poorly managed fire and clearing and habitat loss. So climate change is with us already. It's only going to be exacerbating some of these threats in decades to come. And we've already started to see the effect of that in the horrendous bushfires of 2019 to 20. They drew attention for the scale and intensity of the destruction they caused. They focused the attention of the world on the state of Australia's wildlife. So with this pretty abysmal record of neglecting our wildlife and landscapes, it is really easy to lose hope. But the Australian bush is resilient and this resilience is a source of inspiration. It reminds us that there is always hope but uh, nature desperately needs our help. So in his 2020 witness statement, Sir David Attenborough called on us to rewild the world. He said, to restore stability to our planet, we must restore its biodiversity. Nowhere is this biodiversity restoration more imperative or more urgent than in Australia at the front line of this global extinction crisis. So this brings us to AWC. Our organisation was founded by a British man, a conservationist and visionary, uh, the late Martin Copley. So in the early 1990s, Martin established Karakamaya in the Perth Hills, AWC's first sanctuary. And even back then, Martin had a vision of a new, more efficient, business-like model for conservation, a model that could help lead the way in reversing this drastic decline of Australia's wildlife. So today we have a clear mission, and this year marks 30 years of effective conservation for AWC. So over the past three decades, we've refined this model to conserve and restore biodiversity, which is actually working. And we're implementing this work on a grand scale. So AWC's success can be attributed towards a, a straightforward practical approach to conservation. So we work right around Australia, at sites which are chosen to maximise the diversity of species protected. And we work at scale. So we're purchasing large properties in strategic locations to run as AWC wildlife sanctuaries or establishing partnerships with Indigenous groups, pastoralists, private landholders and state and federal government. So today, AWC protects endangered wildlife across about 16.1 million acres, which makes AWC the largest non-government owner and manager of conservation land in Australia, one of the largest in the world. So we've got a team of about 100, we've got a team of 179 people looking after an area that's half the size of England. So it's a pretty huge effort. 80% of these staff are based in the field, 
And that makes us quite unique. There's no other conservation organisation in Australia which dedicates such a high proportion of resources to frontline work. Our budget is around 15.8 million pounds a year, and this is funded predominantly by private donations. So recently we've been entering into a number of strategic partnerships, which has allowed us to scale up rapidly. And in the past three years alone, we've scaled up with a 44% growth in the area that we manage. So we're really not slowing down, we're only ramping up our efforts. So how do we make all of this work? Well, to achieve our mission, we, we do this through these four key areas. And I've just highlighted the two which I'm gonna talk most about this evening. And that's to get out of there on the ground and deliver practical land management. And we use science to inform, measure, and continuously improve what we do. So through the national portfolio of sanctuaries, we protect more native Australian animal species than any other non-government organisation. We protect a really high proportion of our native species, and the aim is to have 100% of Australian species present in one or more AWC sanctuaries to ensure that these animals are effectively conserved and safeguarded for future generations. So the first point I wanted to make is that Science runs through the very veins of the organisation. Everything we do is informed by science. We do research to understand the connections between native wildlife and their habitats and to identify why and how key threats are driving wildlife decline. So the science program at AWC is the largest biodiversity monitoring program in Australia. We run it, across, we run it every year across all of our sanctuaries and partnerships sites. So even in a COVID year in 2020, we conducted close to 260,000 trap nights. So it's a big effort for the team in the field. So we're really getting people out on the ground looking after country. And one of the most important parts of that is managing fire. So AWC undertakes the largest non-government fire management program in Australia. And it's worth noting that fire is a critical component of Australian landscapes. It, you know, when there's a bushfire, everyone panics, it, it's seen as a bad thing, but it's actually been used for millennia by Indigenous Australians. We're not actually able to exclude fire from our landscapes. It's not possible. The, the ecosystems are meant to burn. But what we can do is we can apply fire really carefully to re-establish healthy fire regimes. And typically that involves carefully planned, low intensity prescribed burning at a large scale. So we use fire as a tool at different times of year for different purposes, whether that's weed control or maintaining open grassland structure. So fire patterns have changed drastically since the onset of pastoralism in Australia and the loss of traditional fire regimes as Indigenous people, Indigenous people were moved off the country. So up in the north, after the wet season, there's a huge buildup of growth in vegetation. So you can imagine this then cures in the baking summer Australian sun and it generates this massive tinderbox of uh, fuel load on the ground. So this becomes a huge threat uh, to these huge destructive wildfires later in the dry season. They can easily cover more than a million hectares once they get out of control and sometimes they can burn for months before going out. So you can just see the destruction they cause there, um, the image on the right. So the aim here is to prevent these highly destructive wildfires and achieve more of this. So AWC implements cool patchy burns early in the dry season, which, aim, which aims to leave a mosaic of burnt and unburnt vegetation of different age classes throughout the landscape. And as you can see here, there's plenty of green tree canopy, and this is especially important for wildlife as it reduces the distance between burnt and unburnt patches of ground and it maintains important food and shelter resources. So it also acts as a fire break, so it can pull up any potential wildfires later in the year. So across our sanctuaries in Northern Australia, we're seeing less of the large scale, high intensity destructive wildfires that are so damaging to these ecosystems and to wildlife. And, and we want the restoration of healthy patchy burns that promote biodiversity. So since AWC has been implementing this model in Northern Australia, the incidence of late season, uh, late dry season wildfires has halved. So the pink here on the map represents the last dry season wildfire 
and the blue represents an early season prescribed burn. So as you can see, we've completely shifted the fire patterns in the central Kimberley. And this is also not only a benefit to biodiversity, but it also prevents around 130,000 tonnes of carbon emissions per annum. So that's the equivalent of taking about 32,000 vehicles off the road. So something else that we're doing uh, on the ground is we're dealing with feral animals. And, and when I say feral, I mean they're invasive species which have been introduced to Australia and have since established wild self-sustaining populations. Um, so it's not just somebody who's left the fence out at the fence open and that's their cattle running around. Uh, it's large feral herbivores, donkeys, camels, buffaloes, horses, pigs, goats, and they're running around in the middle of Australia completely unmanaged and they create enormous damage to our landscapes. They trample and graze vegetation and they degrade our fragile soils as they have, you know, they're hard cloven hooved animals. So you can imagine they have a, a particular impact on wetlands and watercourses. So what we do is we destock large feral herbivores by mustering or culling, and we've established large destocked areas across Australia. So in 2020, we removed over 8,000 large feral herbivores from our sanctuaries and partnership sites. So another big effort in a pandemic year. So we undertake the largest feral animal control program in Australia. And just to demonstrate uh, the benefit of this work. So you'll see here that by excluding cattle from riparian habitats, AWC has actually been monitoring this purple crown fairy wren population. And we've had an increase of over 100%. So as part of our land management programs, much of our Mornington sanctuary has been protected from stock grazing and fire, which has resulted in a dense habitat and provides year round refuge for the wrens. So for anyone who ticked yes, they've been to Australia, you might be familiar with scenes like this, unfortunately. Waterways have just been trampled by livestock. So you can imagine there's nowhere there for the purple crown fairy wren to live. So this is Lake Gladstone. It's the largest wetland in the central Kimberley. And it's one of the only permanent water bodies, which is really, really important for wildlife in the dry season. So this image was taken in 2005 and it just shows that utter destruction caused by cattle uh, to such a sensitive wetland. So we went in there and we destocked. We built a fence to keep out the cattle. And you can see the result. It just shows how different the landscape is once you remove what's not meant to be there. And even more recently, this was taken uh, for the same, same water body, but just a different angle in 2020. So in the north of Australia, the combination of that proper fire management and feral herbivore control generates increases in small mammal and bird populations. But interestingly, fire management and herbivore, uh, feral herbivore control also helps us to reduce the impact of the greatest threat to native wildlife in Australia, which some of you may be surprised to learn, is the feral cat. So feral predators are public enemy number one for Australian wildlife. They pose the single greatest threat to our native species. They have a profound impact on wildlife populations. They kill more than a million native mammals, a million native birds, and a million reptiles every single night. So it's worth understanding how this happens. So Australia is the only continent, aside from Antarctica, which doesn't have its own native cat. So our wildlife haven't evolved with any defences against them uh, preying upon them. So they're highly, cats are highly adaptable and they're prolific breeders. So AWC is really leading the charge in this space by doing a couple of things. One of them is managing habitat to reduce the impact of cats in Northern Australia. We're safeguarding and rebuilding populations of threatened species in secure safe havens, which I'll talk about shortly. And we're also conducting the most extensive research into feral cats ever conducted. And I just wanted to highlight a little, uh, a little snippet of what we found out, which was super interesting in my, in my, in my view. So this is, this is a research study we did in, uh, in Northern Australia. We put GPS collars on 50 cats for this study. It's in the, in the Kimberley. And we wanted to see uh, where they were going and how they were interacting with the landscape. So I'm just going to hone in on one particular um, individual here, one particular cat. So each one of these dots 
is a point in time register on the GPS for a single cat. So uh, you should be able to see the home range here. Uh, and, oh, sorry, the, yeah, I oh, know you can see that, good. Uh, and what actually happened during this study is uh, it was a bit of an opportunistic research because there was a late season fire that removed all of the vegetation that happened over here. So we can see that the cat then leaves its home range, travels 15 kilometres through enemy cat, uh, enemy cat territory to hunt along up and down this fire scar. And that was, that was for a period of two weeks. So you can just imagine it's over there mopping up all of the small native species that just had no vegetation cover at all. So again, what this says to us is that you need to put resources into getting fire management right to limit the range of feral cats and the impact they have on the ground. If you think back to those photos of the, of the barren landscape after just destructive wildfire, and then that trampled ecosystem from introduced herbivores, there's absolutely no shelter there for any small mammals or birds. And this greatly increase, increases the hunting success of cats. So understanding the interaction of these three threats has been vital in order for us to manage our threatened species effectively. But because of the diversity in the Australian environment, we do need to take, oh, oh dear, uh, clear all drawings, there we go. Don't want that on the slide. So uh, we do have to take different approaches for different ecosystems and landscapes. So in the south of the country, we're building a national network of huge feral predator fenced areas or safe havens for wildlife. The reason why these fenced areas are so important is because many of our small marsupials cannot survive outside of these fences. Habitat modification and feral herd predators mean that the fences are the last barrier to extinction for a lot of our endangered species, such as this numbat you'll see here. So a lot of our uh, mammal species are so vulnerable to predation by cats and foxes that they only survive in places that are completely free of these predators. So in order to prevent further extinctions, we need to expand our predator-free spaces. So in the last three years, this is a network of, uh, of our predator, um, feral predator-proof fences across Australia. Um, and in the last three years, we've added three more large scale, of the, uh, large scale areas, including the two largest on mainland Australia, which is Ma uh, Mallee Cliffs, uh, just here, and, uh, and New Haven, the two largest in Australia. We're also, for the very, very first time, venturing into a, uh, doing a fence up in the north of Australia. So that's going to present challenges of its own because of uh, just differences in climate and you also have threats of cyclones and whatnot. So it's a really groundbreaking project we're embarking on there. So what, are, what do they actually look like when I say fences? Well, to give you an idea, uh, this, is, this is them. So basically they have a floppy top on the top so cats can't jump over them and they've got skirting around the bottom so foxes can't dig under them. So our staff in the field uh, do ground perimeter checks once every 48 hours to make sure there hasn't been a fallen branch or a feral camel um, that's come along and knocked it down or compromised the integrity of the fence line. So I'm just going to hone in on one sanctuary and use it as an example of our work uh, with these fenced areas. So this is New Haven Sanctuary in Central Australia. So we're conducting the largest feral cat eradication program in the world. And here we're creating a massive feral fenced area in two stages. So we've completed stage one and it's completely feral animal free and that's 23,000 acres and we're planning on expanding that to a further 250,000 acres. So we're restoring this massive massive landscape to something similar of what the early explorers of Australia would have seen in terms of abundance and diversity of wildlife. So at this site we're going to be returning at least 10 regionally extinct mammals to the area. So it is really hard to get your head around, you know, what does 250,000 hectares look like? Well, this, uh, these are the two fences overlaid onto London. So you'll be able to see uh, there's Bexley Heath here um, in the east, and it would extend all the way past Twickenham here in the west. 
So you can just see the massive, massive scale that we're working on here. And it is easy to forget how vast these landscapes are when we live somewhere like London. So the reintroduction program at New Haven really is a landmark project. And we've already been kicking it, we've already kicked it off in stage one with the reintroduction of the mala, which is this, uh, this little animal here. We've also reintroduced the red-tailed fascigale and the brush-tailed bret betong. So the mala was a particularly important reintroduction for the Walpuri people, um, our Indigenous partners, as it's believed that it's the birthplace of the mala is just outside the southern boundary of New Haven. So it really is an important project that we're doing there. So that, that's how we work on the ground. We restore species to areas from which they're missing. So it's Australia's largest rewilding program. So species like the bilby here on the screen, bandicoots, betongs, and the numbat, which I just showed you, they've just been decimated by feral cats and foxes, and they're, but they're able to repopulate within our network of safe havens. So our program really is about preventing extinctions in the short term. It's that immediate solution to safeguard them from going extinct then it's to rebuild these large sustainable populations of threatened mammal species across multiple sites. And, it's, and thirdly, it's about restoring the ecosystem functions performed by these animals, digging, burrowing, turning over soil. Many of these species play a really important role as ecosystem engineers. And what's enabled AWC to scale up so rapidly with these projects in the past couple of years is our partnership approach. So in 2016, we entered into a partnership with the New South Wales government. And we're managing two sites within the National Parks Estate at Mallee Cliffs and in the Pilliga. So AWC is restoring these locally extinct mammals to both of these sites within our specially constructed feral predator fenced areas. And Really, our partnership progress, partnership projects in New South Wales are really going from strength to strength. At least 10 species are going to be restored to the state, many of which have been extinct in New South Wales for a century or more. So the fence, as I mentioned, at Mallee Cliffs is the largest of its kind. So excitingly, most recently in December uh, 2020, we returned numbats back to New South Wales National Parks for the first time in 100 years. And excitingly, we're happy to report that 100% of the numbats with collars on have survived. So they're going to be supplemented by more individuals uh, next month, actually. So exciting, they'll be joined by their mates really soon. So this really is a significant milestone in our partnership with New South Wales National Parks. And, and the New South Wales government is very engaged with this work. So perhaps the most exciting thing that's come out of this is that new national parks have now adopted the AWC approach and they plan to expand their network of fenced havens within the national parks estate. So AWC has been driving real change in this area and starting to influence how conservation is delivered by other organisations as well. So this feral predator free project is one of the most significant, significant threatened fauna and ecological restoration projects in New South Wales history. So the success of this project has been a catalyst for other state governments which are now approaching us, where lots of species are now at risk. So this here is the northern hairy nose wombat. They can get up to a metre long and weigh up to 30 kilos. They live at least to about 30 years and they spend a lot of their time underground, emerging only at night to feed on grasses and sedges. So sadly, the wild population of this critically endangered species only numbers about 315 individuals. So this species really has not fared well over the last 200 years. Early pastoralists cleared vast tracts of their preferred open eucalypt woodland, um, and they cleared it for grazing, and the wombats also face competition with livestock and rabbits, as well as direct persecu persecution from farmers. But excitingly, the good news is the Queensland Government has invited AWC to join the recovery team and to partner to help conserve the species by working on conservation efforts at the established population sites that already exist in Queensland. And we're also scoping out further sites for reintroduction. So hopefully good news for the, non, uh, the wombat uh, coming very soon. 
So as you probably gathered, partnerships are an increasingly important part of AWC's conservation approach. So in the Northwest Kimberley of Western Australia, this is a region of exceptional global significance for conservation. It's home to some of the most highly threatened anim Australian animal species. So AWC has been contracted by the Department of Defence to deliver land management and science across the country's second largest military training area. So Yampi Sound Military Training Area is one of Australia's great natural areas. It covers over uh, 560,000 hectares of rugged sandstone ranges, rainforest patches, wetlands and stunning coastline. So this partnership started in 2016 and it's the first of its kind between Defence and a conservation organisation. So it's a template that Defence are now interested in rolling out, uh, rolling out with us in other Defence areas. So central to the, to the success of Yampi Sounds was involving Yampi's traditional owners, the Dumbi Mangari people. So since we began working with the Dumbi Rangers at Yampi in 2016, our relationship has just gone from strength to strength. So in 2017, AWC partnered with the Dumbi Mangari Aboriginal Corporation to help manage more than 800,000 hectares of their natal type, native title area along the remote Northwest Kimberley coast. So the first, it's the first project of its kind in Australia, a conservation partnership designed also to generate income and other socioeconomic socio benefits for dummy Mangari people. And excitingly, it, this act is, acted as a catalyst for another partnership with the Willingan Aboriginal Corporation. So this will bring 4.3 million hectares of the Kimberley under AWC management and creates one of the largest continuous private conservation areas on mainland Australia. So 4.3 million hectares, that is about the size of Denmark, just to give you an idea. So having those partnerships in the Kimberley and being able to work across that scale, implementing our model is critical to protect our species that are at highest risk of extinction. So for the first time, we're actually building an inventory of the species that occur in this incredibly important area of the Kimberley. So this little guy on the left is a Mon John. He is Australia's smallest wallaby. So it was only recently discovered around 1970 due to the inhospitable remote nature of the rugged Kimberley. So Mon Johns grow to about 30 centimetres in height and weigh uh, just under 1.4 kilos. So the guy on the right there, the Wailda, is endemic to the West Kimberley. It's also called the scaly-tailed possum, probably not quite the nicer name as Wailda. Uh, it's found across our survey area in rocky habitats, including we, we recorded the first record in granite as well. So this is another one here, the golden back tree rat. Don't let the name put you off. It was presumed extinct from most of its former range across Northern Australia. And it now only occurs in the remote Northwest near coastal section of the Kimberley in Western Australia. So it's named for this beautiful golden stripe along its, uh, along its back from the top of its head to the base of its tail. And it has a little white brush at the tip of the tail. So the, the golden back, back tree rat is nocturnal and arboreal. So by day it sleeps in nests made in the hollows of trees um, and it emerges at night to forage on very diet of flowers, fruits, insects and, and grasses. So excitingly, we now have our ecologists saying that the golden back tree rats can sometimes be found in abundance on our Kimberley sanctuaries and sometimes they're even hanging out in the rafters of the shed at our Charnley station. So I'm going to wrap up shortly, but something I wanted to finish on is just to highlight the way in which we allocate our spending, which has allowed us to have such a big impact in the field. So our model of fiscal accountability as, as an organisation really has allowed us to scale up. We've got 87% of our donation revenue directed to on-ground work where it has the greatest impact in the field. So this is quite unique. Most other conservation organisations in Australia spend around 30 to 40% of revenue on fundraising and admin. So we really are trying to do things differently. So it's a really exciting time for me personally to be involved with AWC. And I hope that you're feeling inspired to know that we do have the toolkit to protect our threatened wildlife. We've got a strong plan to continue growing our land management and science programs. Now, I'd like to finish with a very special message from a very special supporter of ours, 
and I'm going to let him have the final word. Oh, there we go. Australia now is the guardian of a unique collection of animals, and mammals, birds, insects, flowers, unlike anything else in the world. It is a wonder to a, an English naturalist when you go there. Um, and it's all in your hands. What astonishes me about Australia, when you look out and you see this vast area that you have, and the possibilities that you then have of really taking f large scale and swinging solutions to the problem. I look with wonder when I hear AWC talk about building a fence and the thought that an organisation like AWC could devise that plan and put that plan in motion is, is, is mind blowing. That is a marvellous example actually to me of how important it is uh, that you, it should be science-based. It isn't any good just putting a fence around a place and letting him get on with it. Uh, it has to have informed scientists, dedicated scientists, who understand about ecology and indeed about animals, cycles and, and, and ethology and all these things. Only then can you really grapple with the problems. That's and that's, that's why AWC is so, so very important. And science runs through the whole activities of AWC in a most admirable way. And it is essential that it should, if it's going to succeed. There are a lot of ingredients to success uh, in conservation. Part of it, of course, is money. Part of it, of course, is having the area where you can do things. Part of it, of course, is having science behind you. And part of it, of course, is having dedicated people who give their lives to dealing with these problems. Thank you all so much for listening and a huge thank you to the London Natural History Society for hosting me tonight. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Lizzie. That was really fascinating. Um, you kind of, I think, explained the scale of the problem. And I think, but also what was, you know, obviously really good as well, the scales of the, the solutions. And you, the, the, the scale on which you're working is really, is mind, you know, for somebody kind of in England, it is mind boggling. <laughs> Um, you know, because we, we kind of probably don't operate in those sort of scales, but it is amazing to see what's being achieved. And I also like the way you were stressing the importance of the partnership approach, because that's obviously, mm -hmm. obviously been key to the success of what you've been doing, that you're working with actually, you know, and, and perhaps a, quite a diverse range of different organisations, like the mili you know, military organisations, the importance of working with Indigenous people. And again, mm -hmm. you know, that doing that so successfully. And I like obviously um, David Attenborough's uh, emphasis on the science, really mm -hmm. understanding what you're doing um, and understanding the threats and understanding the ways of, of sort of, cha of challenging and dealing with those. So that was really fantastic and with amazing photography. I'm just bowled over by that. So thank That's you ever so much. And we, I can see we're having quite a few questions and comments coming through in the chat. So can we go over to you now, um, David, and we'll pick up some of those questions now? Yeah, we'll do. Um... I'll combine a couple because they, they were they're both about sort of practicalities of managing fenced areas, even big fenced areas. So one question from Janet Harrison was, are you doing research on the populations of the native species and genetic flow given a big fence essentially blocks that? And Jonathan asked about within the fenced areas, do you have um, large native predators to control overpopulation by the native herbivores sort of being good to control kangaroos and things like that mm -hmm. and if not what do you do about that yeah look both really really important questions um particularly yeah the genetic flow is something that is monitored extremely closely so all of our translocations are of, of any any threatened mammal we have to do a very thorough translocation plan we have um a geneticist as part of awc who um studies very, very closely the, uh, the different makeup of different populations. So we have been tracking, because we've been established for 30 years now, so some of our threatened species, um, you know, we've had legacy populations for now 
two, over two decades. So we've got a really good history of genetic flow uh, through different populations. So something that we need to make sure of uh, is when we're translocating to a new population, what, what individuals are made up there and whether we need to substitute with different populations from different sanctuaries or even from captive breeding programs. Um, for example, there's a captive breeding program of numbats at Perth Zoo. So we work very closely with them. Uh, and then sometimes we also harvest from the wild. So there are very, very small isolated populations of, I'll use the numbat again as an example, um, of, uh, of numbats that we are able to harvest some individuals from just to make sure it's got that genetic integrity. Uh, so it's a very, very fascinating space, um, something that I'm particularly interested in. So um, I actually have more information to send if, if the person who asked the question would like to read more about it. Um, and then the feral, uh, sorry, the native herbivores. Yes, also a very, uh, very, very interesting question and an important one to address because we do have an abundance of, say, the, uh, the grey kangaroo, which a lot of people have heard all over Australia now, there's been, because of the change in landscape towards, um, you know, livestock, there's an abundance of water sources around, whereas, you know, pre-European settlement, they would have been able to control their own populations uh, without sort of growing to the numbers they have today. So we do, we manage the landscape in a way that research tells us is most like what it would have been pre-European settlement. So that's sort of around 200, 200 years ago. And if that means occasionally culling a population of, of kangaroo, kangaroos that is getting uh, too big, then, then we will do that as well. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Um, and a, a couple of other fence-related questions. I think the fences are fascinating people. Um, well, well, they're both about the feral predators. How do you make sure you've not got them in your area? And, and, and what do you do if once you've built your fence, presumably there's some in there, do you, how mm -hmm. do you control them? Oh my gosh, once you, once you uh, build the fence, that's only the, the start of the work <laughs> because uh, then we have a very dedicated um, team on the ground who goes through and essentially combs out anything that's not meant to be there. So this is extensive um, camera work. So work with uh, motion sensitive cameras. Uh, we're looking for tracks. We're looking for scats. Um, and this, this area is monitored and monitored and monitored until we can be absolutely sure that it's the last, the last time we saw a, uh, you know, we have to have a certain number of days without seeing any kind of feral predator before we can declare it feral predator free. So there is one uh, very, very pesky fox at the moment, which is holding up a whole rewilding program in uh, the, I mentioned Pilliga State um, National Park in, in New South Wales. We, he's been nicknamed Rambo and he, we just cannot catch him. We've seen him on, um, we've seen camera images of him, we've seen scats, we've seen tracks, um, but he's just proving extremely hard to catch. So until we can, we can track it down and remove it, then we cannot declare it feral predator free because that would just be disastrous if we then lock the gates and start to rewild with our little native mammals that probably wouldn't do too well in there. So um, yeah, it's it's a lot of a lot of work for our, our ground staff. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and there was a question here from, from our own Kieran actually. Um, are there are there new non-native invasive species threats on the horizon that are high risk? Mm, yeah, great question. Um, well, there are a lot, there's a lot in the, in the I know it, I'm, I'm not a uh, botanist myself, but I know that there are a lot of very, very uh, challenge, huge challenges we're getting in terms of um, flora, floral invasive species, as well as, as um, animals as well. So one that we have done a little bit of research in is the cane toad, which is quite famous. Um, a lot of people here might have heard of the cane toad. So that's not a new one. I mean, they were introduced in the 1930s, but still pose a threat to wildlife, particularly across Northern Australia. And with uh, climate change, they're starting to make their way further south. So that's that's an interesting, um, you know, an interesting sort of issue that we're trying to tackle because it's not like uh, with cats and foxes, it's quite easy to locate, an in well, easy, I say, <laughs> easy for me here in London behind my desk, not easy for the field staff. Um, but, you know, as opposed to a, a population of toads, they can have one, hat, uh, lay one hatch of eggs and that's 30,000 
um, toads right there. So they're, they're, it's just working on it a very, very in a very different way than you would with invasive mammals. Um, so we've tried to do, we've done a little bit of research in, with, with uh, cane toads to see whether our native mammals can actually adapt to the cane toad poison rather than going for a full eradication um, method there. So it's almost like, you know, learning to live with the toxin rather than trying to eliminate it entirely because it would almost be impossible. Um, just to add one more thing on that, uh, we are also looking at a, a very novel technology at the moment called gene drive technology. And some people might um, mm. have heard of that with malaria and mosquitoes. It's it's really, really interesting space. So essentially at the moment we have um, partnered with the CSIRO, the national uh, science body in, in Australia. And we're looking at whether the gene drive technology can be applied in our invasive species in Australia. So we'd be looking at um, being able to alter the genome of feral cats in particular to uh, only produce uh, male offspring. So we'd be looking at eventually getting the, uh, the cat population to naturally uh, end up not being able to breed anymore. So that is a space that's very, very new and that's sort of decades away at the moment because we have to also understand that if you put a genetically altered cat in the landscape, how far is it going to go we don't we don't know enough about the ecology yet to be able to start doing field trials but um yeah it's it's really really exciting excellent um now just a couple of a couple of questions about sort of groups that are covered and things that are covered so so mm -hmm. wendy noted that there's quite a lot she seems to be aware of quite a lot of persecution of bats in australia poses mm. and helicopters used and is something being done to protect bats Mm. and a completely different type of organism. Robin asks, um, is conservation of plant diversity also part of AWC's objectives or is mm -hmm. that someone else? Yes, yes, we have two, I'll start with the plants. So we have two um, full-time uh, plant ecologists who do vegetation surveys. So they, make, they do a lot of research into things like how is vegetation impacted um, outside versus inside of our fenced areas. So what, what, is the, what are the impacts of the, our native digging mammals and other species actually doing for the soil and for the vegetation as well? So um, a very strong emphasis on that. Um, then the, the bats, that's, uh, yeah, I, when I, I was in Australia, I spent some time in Brisbane. So there was the flying, colonies of flying foxes everywhere uh, around Brisbane. And it was that, you know, very divided debate that a lot of people loved them. Um, but a lot of people really didn't like them at all. So yes, bat conservation is a tricky one. Um, we don't actively involve in, you know, we don't really have um, a lot to do with, with bats in itself. You know, we're, we're, we have bats present on our on the sanctuary. So we have um, flying foxes, but, and also micro bats as well. But in terms of the really, uh, you know, there are a lot of bat conservation groups in Australia as well. Um, yeah, so it's not one of our focus species, but definitely something that's there and that we're protecting. Mm. Excellent. Um, and then two, two questions about involvement with government, really, I guess. Emma, mm -hmm. Emma has asked, um, is your fire management program being adopted as, as government policy? And is that something you push for? And, and more generally, JK asked on how you're doing converting federal politicians to nature conservancy? <laughs> Oh gosh, well, if uh, anyone has the answer to that, please tell me, because I think we, we need that. Um, yeah, the fire, the fire is, uh, it's been, a, our model of fire management, it really combines a lot of, um, as I was saying, sort of that traditional knowledge with science and technology, so we can do it on a massive, massive scale. So it's been proven to work so well in Northern Australia that it has become the template for best practice fire management across Australia. So it isn't mandatory by government. Fire is also a very tricky uh, area, uh, sort of topic in Australia because you have, you know, because of the destruction of wildfires, a lot of people in more urban areas will just completely disagree with the uh, with prescribed burning so there's a little bit of a mismatch of uh, sort of education knowledge there that we still do need to burn and the other problem is is that we kind of know what you know we have we have a really good template of fire management in northern Australia 
But in Southern Australia, the ecosystems are completely different and we can't just apply the same model in different ecosystems. So that requires a lot more research. And there's also been sadly a lot of traditional knowledge that has been lost from Southern Australia because that's where um, European settlement happened first. So they're dispossessed from the land very early. Um, then, uh, sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> sorry, David. Um, <laughs> or did I answer uh, that? Uh, was, there was fire as, um, um, is that being adopted as a government policy? Yeah, no, not, not adopted as government policy. No, no. Um, yes, but we are, we are paving the way for other organisations and, and pastoralist Indigenous groups to uh, start managing the landscape in the same way. Yeah. Um, I did just see a, sorry, I did just see something pop up about COP26 and I did just want to quickly say that. Uh, we will be there. I should have mentioned it in my presentation, by the way. If anyone is in Glasgow, um, we'll be there. My colleague and I will be there from the 8th to the 11th and we are exhibiting um, on the 9th in the green zone. So that is public facing if anyone would like to come and say hello. Thanks, that's great. And I think that's probably quite a good um, place to stop. But I just wanted to, if you could let us know, how can people get in touch with you? How can they find out more about your organisation? What will be a good way of, of kind of following up if people, you know, people would like to know more, maybe yeah. even contribute to your organisation? Of course. Oh, that would be absolutely wonderful. And um, I really hope that everyone's feeling happy and inspired after that and not all doom and gloom. I'm just popping my uh, details in the chat there. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you had any questions that didn't get answered. And uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure to be here. So thank you for having me.